IFS Global Conference. Global competence is our feature, it's our responsibility. We are very glad to have you all here. I had the chance to talk to you, many of you. I have attended conferences with some of you, exchanged tweets and emails. I know, and I know for sure that we are in the company of some very talented, very passionate, very engaged educators that is going to change this world. So we are very delighted to have you all here. Once again, welcome. Thanks to the support of our sponsors and content partners, we have more than 400 people joining us from 70 and even more countries gathered here and we're going to learn and share with each other through more than 100 sessions. We have idea dates, we have special AFS Now sessions, we have many plenaries for you, so try to make the best of this conference. This week, our goal is to share ways to engage more stakeholders in many different ways to take ownership of the global competence movement and make it a priority for everyone around the world. We know as we try to do this, aligning all these stakeholders is not an easy ask and one size does not fit all. But we also know that together, working every day tirelessly, we can make this happen. We are going to turn this into a reality. So I wanna encourage you not to keep the discussions just among yourselves. Try to talk with as many people as you can here, but also share it externally. Talk to people outside, send emails, send tweets, send, use the social media. We do want our discussions here to go much beyond this room. And guess what is our hashtag is? All right, okay. Seems like everyone knows what the hashtag is. All right, now it is my pleasure to introduce to you our first keynote speaker. Clive Lee is the Chief, Educa uh, Chief Executive Officer of the Yidan Prize Foundation which awards teachers, researchers, academics, policymakers, and advocates taking on some of the world's greatest educational challenges. Clive has been uh, recognized by many organizations around the world for his philanthropic, social entrepreneurship, and work, uh, nonprofit, uh, nonprofit work. His contributions have been recognized by the Harvard University, Garmin Creative Lab, and the Clinton Initiative. After Clive's remarks, the chair of AFS Board of Trustees, Dr. Vishaka Desai, will join him on stage to moderate this evening's panel. So please, please join me in welcoming Mr. Clive Lee. Good evening, everyone. It's my first time in Budapest. For those who have visited here, I envy you. I should come here earlier. Uh, in fact, today I would like to share a little bit um, about global competence. And first, uh, I feel very honored to be invited by AFS to give a keynote speech on behalf of Yilan Prize. Yilan Prize was established by a philanthropist in China, the founder of Tencent, Mr. Charles Chen. Um, he established this prize to create a better world through education. He believed education does not be, uh, belong to one nation, it belongs to humanity, and it is the most important solution to solve the world's problem and create a better world and enable social progress. As the world's largest education prize to recognize innovative future-oriented educators who have transformative and sustainable impacts. The prize is more than just an award, but a social investment. Among the four million US dollars prize, half will be the cash prize to the individual, and half 
will be the project subsidy that enable innovative educators to further expand their impacts. And today I feel so honored um, to share a little bit about global competence. According to OECD, there are four steps. Understanding, appreciation, interaction, and taking actions. It's about how to understand different perspectives, different cultural issues, appreciate others' perspectives. More importantly, having effective interactions with people from all over the world across different cultures. And then, it's more than just understanding or discussion. It's about taking actions to create a more sustainable and also a collective well-being future. So why global competence? It's because of economy, because, because of um, we are more, we're traveling in more uh, geographical locations. In fact, all the above are correct. Compared to 20 years ago, we have more trades, more investment from all over the world. And even the students travel a lot. For example, we have 5.6 times international students than before. And we also have more international students enrolling in OECD countries uh, in their members' nations. And apart from all this, it's also about a sharing of knowledge. Currently, we have more academic uh, collaborations that enable the wisdom to transfer. And it further foster collaborations. But above all, I think the most important thing is we are trying to build a generation of actions, a generation who can enable our future to be a better place. We should teach our students how to solve problems. We should create a generation even better than us so that we can put all these problems and challenges behind. Besides, we all know where is the knowledge. Knowledge is at the fingertip. It's on the internet. But what differentiates us from robots are how we understand our world and how we interact with other people. Today, um, according to our Yidan Prize uh, laureate from Alex, they provide courses for over 70 million students. So in future, our students can access knowledge through on the internet. But it's more important that we enable them how to interpret this knowledge and how to apply in the society. Talking about global competence, how do you see our economies are preparing uh, our students for future skills? Probably we cannot answer. So that's why last year we partnered with Economist Intelligent Unit to launch out this Worldwide Educating for the Future Index. It covers 35 economies measuring free environments, policy, teaching, and social economy. Among the 35 economies, we cover 88% of GDP and 77% of population. And this year, by the end of this year, we will announce our this year's result. Uh, we will expand to 50 economies. So we identify six future skills, and top of the list is global competence. 
here is the result. Surprisingly, uh, apart from uh, Scandinavian countries, uh, which always top on the list, huh? uh, New Zealand and Singapore, Canada went very high in our index. And we also investigate in different um, environments. Singapore went number one in policy. New Zealand went the first in teaching. Finland went the first in social economic. It's about whether the economies are putting the six future skills into their strategies. Lastly, I would like to share these findings with all of you. According to our index, over half of the economies are not preparing their students for future skills, including global competence. And exactly, global competence and classroom, beyond classroom uh, learning are limited. We have one of the biggest challenge in our learning um, environment now. Also, learning global competence is also related to our environment. Is our society um, embracing different students from different backgrounds? So I won't go into details, so you can't see <laughs> in details here, but uh, we have 32 indicators, and you can download the report. I would like to close this speech by um, quote from Lao Tzu. A journey of 1,000 miles begins with a single step. And today, in this room, we are taking a step together to build a movement and to build a generation of global citizens. Thank you. Thank you, Clive, for that very thoughtful, informative, and an opening remark that can get us started. So thank you very, very much for that wonderful uh, keynote. Good evening, everyone. It's a great pleasure for me to be here on behalf of my colleagues all over the world who are the part of the AFS family. So I really stand here for all of my AFS network colleagues. Um, as you know, all of you are here because you believe in global competence. I don't have to convince you because you wouldn't be here if you didn't believe it. I think it's fair to say that we are here to not so much talk about why, but how and the what of global competence. And when we think about that, because we all are believers, I want to take just a moment to remind us that we are living in a world where even the very word global is very problematic for many people. I just came from New York this morning after the UN General Assembly had begun its deliberations. And as you know, the leader of, the elected leader of the United States, Donald Trump, very uh, clearly stated that we reject the ideology of globalism and accept the doctrine of patriotism. Everywhere we look, there is a feeling of borders going up, feeling of as if nationalism is against globalism, patriotism in opposition to globalism. And because of that, we have to recognize that the backlash is fierce. While we all believe in the idea of global learning, global competence, global citizenship, we also have to recognize 
that these discussions are quite perilous. And as a result, I would like to suggest that we think about why that is, that there is such a backlash, and rethink the urgency with which we need to discuss this issue and retake, redefine the very idea of global that actually includes and allows people not to see it in binary terms versus nationalism or localism. So I often think about this notion of why is it that there is such a strong backlash? And Pico Iyer, the great writer, has actually written very eloquently about this symbiotic relationship between the two realities. The more internationalism there is in the world, he says, the more nationalism there will always be. As people feel scared of the other streaming into their neighborhood and don't always know where to lay their foundations in a world on the move, some people will always ground themselves very strongly in a piece of soil, a grandmother's property, a tiny plot of land, and that's great. But in the age of movement, there is no question that the number of people who don't or can't is growing exponentially. One could argue that because the global is under attack is that we need to rescue it with a more layered and a non-binary context and create a sense of urgency about why we need to do that. And that because we all know that the interconnected, interdependent world isn't going away. And as Clive pointed out, economy tells us that, but it's also very boldly evident in the fact that there's constant movement of people. Today, there are close to 300 million people who live in a place that is not their home. We know that lightning speed of communication and technology isn't gonna go away anyway, anytime soon. And the transnational nature of major global challenges, environment being the biggest one, one might say, actually demands that we come back to global competence. We come back to global literacy. And we demand that this is not a luxury for the privileged few but for everyone. So the task for us is to actually figure out how to make this idea, this movement for everyone. It doesn't matter where they live, where they are, how can they think of themselves in the world, learn about the world and with the world is a necessity because the world will continue to be interdependent in a way that is growing. And because of that, we need to recognize that the word global competence cannot be just a buzzword, an abstract notion. We need to put specificity behind it. We need to figure out not just the why and the how, but the what. And that what must include what I would call multi-rooted globalism, something that Anthony Appiah has called multi-rooted cosmopolitanism, meaning that let us learn locally what we can do globally and then go back and forth between these two. So I hope that in the time that we have together for these two and a half days, that we really actually think about what it would be, what it would take, to create an essential set of attitudes, skills, and knowledge that prepare us and our students and the young people who are going to be the leaders of tomorrow to work across differences, conflicts, and ambiguity to find better and more innovative and more successful solutions than we can when working alone. Because the reality is that there is something about this idea of coming together, not just to respect each other, not just to understand differences, but to use those respect and differences to create 
new solutions that we cannot do alone. And it is for that reason that we have brought together exceptional group of people for this first plenary panel to really look at the what, the why, and the how of global competence from multiple perspectives. So may I ask my fellow panelists to come up to the stage, please. backgrounds as soon as we start into the conversation. <laughs> we are not allowing them to make any speeches, so we're just going to go right into the questions and conversations themselves. So I want to start with you, Simona Mirela. Simona Mirela Michulescu is a representative of the United Nations Secretary General and also the head of the United Nations office in Belgrade. Um, we are thrilled you're with us. And it seemed to me that since I actually invoked the United Nations in my speech, given what was going on over there, all of us were pretty shocked. However, it just seems to me that with UN as really the citadel of things global, that we should begin with you, that when we think about what's required by teams tackling SDGs, and Clive already pointed out the SDGs. All of this is really about making the world a better place. How do you see global competence coming into play from policymaking, funding, and getting everybody actually on board? First of all, thank you very much for the chance of uh, being here with you tonight. Um, Right now, I'm representing the Secretary General in the Balkans, so my role is mainly political. So the educator in me and the former diplomat in me um, kind of misses those times when I was dealing directly with youth, education. But now I'm just a UN employee who will speak to you tonight and also a former educator, even a mom, because all, even moms are uh, interested in global competence. Uh, and um, It takes a village. It takes a, absolutely, absolutely. Right. Um, so, I was very excited when I heard about the topic because, unfortunately, we are overwhelmed with incompetence all over the world. So, <laughs> participating in a conference that has as an objective to identify ways of educating increasing global com I couldn't be more thrilled. So, I tell you, I'm very happy to be here and I'm very honest. I'm not just formal, you know, d making a speech from the UN rostrum like I used to do when I was an ambassador to the UN. Thank you for not doing that. <laughs> <laughs> well, that has also an importance. Of course. The of UN course. rostrum is important right. and I would like to mention that even if Mr. President Trump makes the headlines these days, I can assure you that there are a lot of important things that happen these days in New York. There are hundreds of heads of states and governments and ministers of foreign affairs who actually try to identify ways of improving our future and our world, your world. So let's not minimize that. Agree, agree. And I think that one of the things that I was very gratified by is that how many people came together to say we are not about that. So well, I won't transform this into right. a political right. debate right. because right. we have more important things to, to discuss tonight, uh, <laughs> but especially global competence. But my uh, wish is to tell you first that global competence has become a top priority. Well. The United Nations is the only universal organization. Its pillar, one of its main pillars, is global competence. You cannot deal daily with lives, with conflicts, with helping people without being competent. And youth has been, from the inception of the organization, a priority. And I would like to tell you just a few things, just be a tough moderator, because, you know, I have this uh, pleasure of speaking. Thank you for giving me that permission. Absolutely. You got it. You got it. 
But it's important in this context to mention a few tools that the UN has, because I'm proud to say that on Monday, there, there was another tool that the UN added in order to help youth and, of course, education, uh, education uh, the education of youth. So, we all the time, of course, speak about the Sustainable Development Goals. Of course, th the Agenda 2030 has, uh, has um, uh, a crucial importance because actually it tackles absolutely every aspect of the life, of our lives. Um, and um, you, of course, you know about uh, 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 the objective number four, about the target 4.7. All this is already known. But I want you to know that there are also a few resolutions of the Security Council that deal with youth, that you could use in, you know, or you could connect to them. We could find ways, we should find ways to connect with all these tools that the UN offers. And that's why I was thinking of giving you a little list. Um, and uh, please remember that there are two Security Council resolutions 225, uh, 2250, which was adopted in 2015 on youth peace and uh, development, and also uh, 2419 in 2018, that actually is a, an upgrade of the previous resolution. So this is a Security Council. This is no joke. You know very well that you know, uh, the can Security you, Council is the, the main interest of everybody. So this is a very- Can you mention whether these, because they are the Security Council, Yes. Are they actually talking about global competence and young people in the context of security? In, or, and how is it different from goal four of SDG? Because um, actually what the UN Youth Envoy and the UN Secretary General wanted was to give even more um, weight to the issue of youth, because we all know, and we are kind of frustrated sometimes, even when I was an ambassador, we were frustrated that the issues in the General Assembly don't have the same visibility like the ones in the Security Council. Everything that is adopted in the Security Council has more, more, much more political weight. What we discuss in the General Assembly, of course, it's also important, but if the Security Council tackles an issue, that remains much, uh, the imprint is much, 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 uh, 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 profound. Um, I would like to, to say that I'm very proud of my colleagues from UNICEF and especially from UNESCO because they are your main partners right. in global competence and of right. course in uh, the so-called global citizenship right. education right. platform which is an amazing platform that has to right. be used much more and the academic impact right. I'm sure that you are cooperating very closely. So um, now what happened on Monday? Well, the UN Secretary General, if, the, if there are myriads of uh, projects, platforms that try to help the youth cause, and of course, implicitly, education for global competence, well, he wasn't uh, happy enough. And he asked the UN Youth Envoy, a very, very brilliant lady, I hope that you are also cooperating with her, um, to be a rebel and to think of something something to, 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 to um, give new meanings and um, new, uh, new weight, actually, to, to the youth issue. So, on Monday, the Secretary General launched the new strategy for youth. It's called Youth 2030. Please make an effort, go online and read it, because this is actually the umbrella under which all the efforts of the UN will be placed. And um, of course, I won't go into, into, into it because there is no to time. I'm be now rude, exactly yes. because you gave me permission. Yes. And we'll come back to this. Ah, but okay, sure. Is that okay? Yeah. I just wanted to, to mention that uh, this one, and also, and I'll finish, I promise. <laughs> I keep my promises. It's very important that he mentioned not mentioned, he highlighted how important the partnerships are. So each of you in this room can be a partner to this uh, strategy, and there is already a partnership officially launched by the Secretary General on the same day called Generation Unlimited. I love that title. Thank this you. is a good end for the first so Forever young, <laughs> of course. <laughs> uh, Peter, thank you so much for being here. Peter is the head of the European Group Regional President for Global Energy Company, BP, 
and BP has been a great partner for AFS in terms of scholarships, and thank you very much for that support as well. Um, since we talked a little bit about the young people and the global competence and the UN, and clearly everything UN does needs to have this kind of global competence embedded in it. Can you talk a little bit about the dynamics of global competence in private sector, especially for a company like yours that is in so many different countries? How do you think about that? And how do you actually think about that vis-a-vis -vis the workforce for today and as you go forward? Well, uh, first of all, it's an absolute pleasure to be here. Um, AFS is very important to BP, uh, has been for a while, and we're delighted to, to be supporters, and, and thank you for inviting me to, to be here. It's quite interesting because um, uh, I actually had another reason to be in, in Hungary, because we have a, uh, quite a big operation here now, uh, which is our sort of global support services center, uh, which is between Budapest and then about, about 1,700 people here and about 500 people down the road in Zeged. And we've only had these offices here for a, for a year or two. In fact, Zeged is its first year anniversary today. And these are, these are, these are people uh, that we've employed that deal with a multiple number of countries. Mm -hmm. So they're polylingual, um, they have all kinds of different skills. Uh, and I was down there today and I was just talking to, to a, whole, a whole group of them. Uh, and it made me realize actually what kind of global competence was, because I was thinking, gosh, I'm going on the stage this evening, I need to be, <laughs> say something vaguely intelligent. Um, and uh, just the, the, the competence I saw amongst that, that group of people whose average age was probably about half of mine, um, mm -hmm. and the sorts of things that they were doing w was, was great. Look, I mean, global competence. I mean, we are a global company, uh, and we try and be competent. We certainly try and be excellent, actually. Uh, but global excellence is possibly something that's a little bit uh, too aspirational. Um, and we're right in the middle of probably um, the biggest challenge, or one of the biggest challenges that the world has at the moment, which is you know, the dual challenge of providing affordable and secure energy that can help lift people out of poverty and help them move and light their homes and, and, uh, uh, and power their, their activities whilst at the same time being sustainable, whilst at the same time ensuring we don't destroy the planet. And that, that is a particular, uh, a particular responsibility. I think we talked about the responsibility of global right. uh, competence. And it seems to me that those kinds of issues, you cannot just come in, parachute in, and apply a solution that comes from somewhere unless you're locally sensitive. Yeah. So that there is that notion of local and global both solutions and responsibilities, that seems to be very important. Uh, absolutely. I, I remember once at a conference, somebody coined the phrase glocal. I don't know if it's still used, but <laughs> the combination of Yeah, that's about 20 years ago. Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> Michelle, well, I'm showing my age. Um, but I mean, for us, it's actually quite relevant because, uh, you know, energy, well, the future of the planet is a global issue. Right. But the right. solutions are going to be local. Right. Okay. So climate change, frankly, if the emissions go up in country, in one country, it doesn't really matter which country it is because right. it affects all of us. But it's in that country where a local solution needs to be found. Right. So, um, no, so we, we, have to, we have to think deeply about, you know, where can we best deploy our own resources, both human and, and financial, to make the biggest impact. And how do you think about it in terms of the workforce? And as you begin to think about hiring the younger yeah. generation, I mean, all the statistics, I was just reading something about the new report that just came out from, from Bloomberg that actually younger people are much less anti-global than people who are in their 40s and 50s, and that therefore they're naturally inclined to be much more transnational and global, partly because this is a generation of people that doesn't know any world but an online world, if you will. Mm. They grew up with that. So how do you think about that in terms of the workforce? Well, I think, I think um, we tend to look for people who do have you know, cultural skills. Right. Uh, I mean, on top of all the other skills that you need in terms of problem solving, and I think you put mm. some of them up, Clive, and I, I agree with your list. Um, 
But we, yeah, we need people who are curious about the world. We need people who are, who are interested in, because as I say, they might be based in one country, but the solution might be somewhere else, and we might need them to go somewhere else. So, uh, I mean, uh, you know, as a company, we have a, quite a deep tradition of moving people around the world, a little bit less than we used to, because we, we try and employ more local people now, obviously. We used to sort of parachute in Brits yeah. and Americans, but that, that's all that's Yeah, the all expat culture. Yeah, that's no, that's, all, that's all gone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that's yeah. all gone. So, um, so no, I think we're, you know, we're looking for people who are, you know, who are curious uh, about um, other places, but ultimately problem solvers. I mean, and that can be, you know, with a STEM background. I mean, we, we do some fantastic stuff with, with AFS, actually. Uh, well, I think STEM this Academy. new STEM Academy yeah. that also brings cultural competence in quick, it. Quick plug, about 100 people, 100 kids a year, uh, 15 to sort of 17, uh, going to a sort of STEM prolonged workshop of f about four weeks, I think, in, in a country not of their own. I think we're in the US and we're in uh, Brazil. E Egypt and, Br and Brazil. Um, and, you know, pre, pre the tertiary studies uh, and gives them a fantastic sort of dose of right. the sort of things that we face in terms, not only sort of STEM issues, but also problem solving, the issues facing right. the world, interpersonal Intrusive. skills, cultural exactly. skills. Exactly. So, um, so no, we, we, we obviously look for great engineers right. and we look for great geologists, but we also look for, great, for people that can apply those skills in a great way, because there's no point in being the best engineer in your class if you can't actually communicate what, right. what, what, you right. want, what needs to be done. And or, or if you can't, inf you know, infect other people with your, with your vision right, and your enthusiasm. Right. And I think that brings me, Larissa, to you. And both as a teacher, as the head of Teach for Armenia, um, sometimes what happens with these questions of global competence is that everybody's only talking about process, how to have the skill sets that's about intercultural learning, and it's all about how. But as a teacher, how do you think about global competence, both in terms of content and the skill sets that the students need to get, both from your experience in Teach for Armenia and as a teacher yourself? Um, it's, uh, can you hear me okay? <laughs> my, my microphone goes up and down a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see if you can, yeah. Okay. Um, so I was a teacher actually eight years ago, and, and the way I, I came into the profession was through Teach for America, uh, which is an amazing organization. It's been around for about 30 years now, and um, has prioritized actually serving and working with children in underserved communities in the United States. And now there's a huge global network called Teach for All. There's 48 countries that are kind of catalyzing this generation of, of young leaders to um, you know, better the world, better their countries uh, through this teaching, this two-year teaching experience. And I have the privilege of leading the organization in Armenia. We are the 36th partner to the Teach for All Network, and I'm here on behalf of Teach for Armenia and also Teach for All. Um, and really, like to us, um, the global competence piece looks very different for the kids that we serve in, in underserved uh, communities. And in Armenia specifically, I mean, we're really trying to currently figure out um, what global competence means for our kids in Armenia. Because there are differences between from village to village and there's, uh, you know, there's uh, Armenians versus Kurds versus Russians. And, and, I, I, and I'm assuming that for many of us here, you know, the, even the internal uh, global competencies that we're trying to figure out uh, exist today. And, and I don't think we really know what we're doing half of the time with it. I think that you're making a very important point that we all need to think about, A, that you work with underserved communities. So oftentimes this idea that global competence is only for people who are in big metropolitan areas, and therefore we don't pay attention to why this is important for everybody. And then the second point that you're raising is this notion of there is diversity within our small communities. So how can we actually use intercultural competence to go towards global competence? And that those two are not necessarily the same, but there's a path. And it seems to me that you're sort of right at that point of how to do that. 
Yeah, and, and really, we have to think about all kids because m more than half of, you know, half of the world's population is underserved. And, and if we're thinking about markets and building businesses and so on and so forth, whether we're in the public or private sector, we have to, we have to think through the lens of, of all kids and, and what global competence looks like depending on the socioeconomic demographic we're working with. Um, so, I mean, to, to the second question, really what, what we're trying, what we're understanding now is that the knowledge teachers have and bring to classrooms is obviously very important. And in our program, we definitely re select teachers who are wildly intelligent and, and are very successful academically, but what we're putting maybe like even just as much importance on is who they are as people. Mm -hmm. Are they empathetic? Are they good citizens? Do they love kids? Do they care about the trajectory of their country? Um, are they inclusive? Are they, you know, do they value diversity? And to us, these competencies are just becoming increasingly more important and we're of the belief that soon, you know, technology will probably take over a lot of the, the knowledge piece that teachers, you know, have originally served throughout history and now you know teachers are going to become more and more uh, facilitators of knowledge and and ensuring that kids uh, have access to the content that exists online for example so even more uh, in the next 10 years we think that who the teachers are as people are incredibly important so we're currently already doing that in, in our program um, and our hope is that through through these wonderful leaders, through these people that are serving uh, within you know Armenia and these communities, our students will ultimately kind of follow the same so trajectory. In a way, I think what you're suggesting also is that for teachers or for students, it isn't so much about content being imparted as much as a way of thinking and a way of being that becomes very important. But, I mean, as we heard from Peter, content and specialization at some point will become important. I mean, at what stage? So we have to create this layering approach of what do we mean by content, what do we mean by attitudes, what do we mean by skill sets as we think about global competence. And that brings me to you, Clive, and that is that it seems like this is so important You've made this case, you're all making this case. Why is it so hard? Oh. I think um, it's because it's difficult to measure. Uh, but um, um, I I'll share my favorite quote from Little Prince. Mm. The most important thing is invisible to the eye. I think uh, although it's the most difficult thing to measure, it is the most important thing. Uh, according uh, to um, some uh, educators, uh, global competence can be divided into different aspects. Um, and in this area, I do encourage everyone here to contribute in assessing global competence. I learned that AFS has developed uh, the uh, global competence uh, certificate. I think it's a great uh, step. And OECD has that, yeah. each society is doing it, so yeah. Yeah, so by having all the stakeholders taking apart, and together we can have a good database assessing these skills. And I would also uh, encourage um, students to take actions uh, with, um, according to global competence. Is a demonstration of our new generation. How can they take part in changing the world? Uh, like uh, what uh, our panel speakers have shared, I think we, we need more actions. And it's especially we should pick, uh, put the focus in youth, not seeing them as uh, outside you know, the solutions. They should be part of the solutions. And I'm looking forward to the next announcement in, on Monday. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and Peter, that sort of, in a way, suggests that we need to tell specific examples, specific stories, mm -hmm. young people and others. Are there ways that BP has worked with 
local communities and bringing this kind of local global connections. How do you train your employees to do that, to work in that particular kind of setting? Are there some specifics that you can tell us? Well, I, th I think it's a, it's a very interesting question. We, we find actually that the, if you like, extracurricular activities that, that we do as a company are one of the most attractive elements of, of the sort of the future employment contract. People notice that we do stuff, a lot of stuff in the education sector or in the arts sector or supporting uh, local enterprise. Uh, and that means a lot because I think, you know, the generation younger than, the, the, than me look at that possibly more than our generation did when we were just trying to get a job, you know. So I think, um, I think that's important. So we provide, uh, I mean, it varies country by country, again, because it, it's, a, it's a social, right. cultural thing. Right. And, um, right. But we provide you know, appropriate time off to do things. We provide appropriate volunteering uh, opportunities. Um, we also encourage uh, our people to find solutions to things. I mean, one, one example that really resonates with me, and I've, I talk about it a lot, is uh, in Australia, we had a problem with um, the Aboriginal community sniffing petrol, mm -hmm. you know, getting addicted to sniffing mm -hmm. hydrocarbons. Um, you know, a, a slight, a, an even more dangerous version of glue sniffing. Mm. And um, just some people in, the, in, in our company decided that, you know, this is something that, that, that we needed to, so they worked on a whole program and, uh, and won lots of awards for it to try and, you know, educate the local communities around some of these sites not to do it and the dangers and various things that were put in the, in the fuel to discourage. So, you know, so that just, again, it kind of bubbled up. Right. Um, but I think the other thing that companies in the education sector, companies like mine, do and should do more of is support teachers, support parents. Yeah. Um, and we do, a, we do a lot of that because uh, I'm sure for, for all of us, a lot of the uh, most formative individuals in our lives have been, have been teachers. Um, and they've helped you think about your own competence right. or, lack, or lack thereof. <laughs> yeah. And uh, we were just talking just before this conference that actually one of the biggest issues around global competence and challenge is also to train teachers yeah. about that idea of global competence so that they're so used to teaching math and history and it's a subject matter expertise. And that goes back to Larissa, what you were saying is that really how to create that sense of learning about global competence that isn't just about subject matter yeah. is such a big piece. So whatever we can do to help teachers becomes really, really important. And I think it's, it, it's about enthusing them about their own subject, but it's also about making them see how their own subject is actually relevant to all kinds of different right. things. Right, so, exactly. So, you know, if you are, a, if you are teaching physics, right. You know, you might actually be teaching a future novelist. I mean, right. you know, and, and, and it's just—it's right. not just about you are going to be a physicist. And I no, think I think exactly. that's that's important. And in terms of your work and the peace building work you have done, it seems to me that that's another place where intercultural learning, global competence, really begins to be very, very important. Talk to us a bit about what does that really mean in in practice. But can I make first a point, because I'm yes. very incited by what Larissa and uh, absolutely. Um, Peter said. Uh, because I adore teachers. Each of us has a teacher that inspired him or her yeah. in life, right? Uh, teachers, exactly as you said, will be mostly maybe facilitators of knowledge. Right. And of course we should support them to, 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 um, to teach their subject, but I think that much more important than anything else is to look at the teachers at, at, as our models mm -hmm. and as our mentors. Right. A robot will never be able to be that, even if it's as sophisticated, sophisticated as Sophia. No, I think that we should help teachers also in this respect, to be able to support and encourage the younger generation because you know, we all think that they are strong and they, ha, they are strong leaders. No, they need a lot of help and encouragement and support and love. Um, 
Well, of course, working in Iraq and working in Kosovo, I was involved in practical situations, let's say, of peace building. Um, even now, working in the Balkans, um, we are witnessing every day um, uh, tensions because you know very well, for instance, I'm based in Belgrade, uh, in, in, uh, there is a problem between Kosovo and Serbia and there is a dialogue that takes place, but at the level of the population, at the level of youth, there's still a lot of tension, there is still a lot of trauma that generates all sorts of let's call them um, unfortunate attitudes, in, to call them in an elegant way. So, um, someone mentioned the word empathy. Mm -hmm. Empathy plays a huge role in such, in such uh, situations, of course, adding to everything that you rightly said about uh, the, the features of, of the global competence. Uh, respect, tolerance. These are key words in absolutely any exercise dealing with global competence. I think you just took a page out of AFS. <laughs> this is what we all think about, learn about at the age of 16 because you have no choice. <laughs> and that's why it changes your life. Absolutely. The very, very fact. Uh, Risa, in terms of the work that we're talking about, where do you feel are the biggest challenges? for us to actually be able to get to this notion of what is the local need, global competence, and the relationship between the two? Um, I think we were thinking uh, about global competence, you know, within this conference, but also in the world, stri not strictly, but mostly through what we should be doing through our classrooms, our education, which is obviously very important, but the way I look at it is there needs to be political alignment with the fact that global competence is important. It's a priority. We want our kids to grow up globally competent. And so definitely teachers play a huge role in this, but also parents and principals and community leaders and politicians. I mean, historically, education, you know, unfortunately has been used uh, as, a, as a mechanism through which you know, politicians have controlled populations and there have been many, many countries in which education was actually serving the p purpose of controlling people, of not educating people. And so we really need to kind of understand where our country's context is and, and to, uh, you know, kind of look back to understand what we've been through, where we are today and, and why we're here and, and to really plan for the future. But uh, unless there's real alignment, um, I think it'll be very challenging to do. So the convergence for me is not so much in, in the classroom as it is, you know, just it's a systemic, it's a systemic issue. And, and I think that we need to look at global competence through the, the, the systemic lens. I mean, it seems to me that one of the big issues is that when we think about global competence and we think that's a luxury, but that the urgency is about getting a job and I know, for example, in India, the Skilling Commission, which is really all about how to prepare you for a job. And it is thought that essentially vocational schools will do that. But that means that they'll, you create a class structure where some people will do nothing but at that level and those jobs will go away. So a colleague of mine, Gayatri Spivak, a great theorist uh, at Columbia, often says that we need to think about the brain also as a part of our body. And you have to train people to use it. And it seems to me there's something about global competence. It's also about imagining an opportunity in the world. And how do we do that? Because half the time we're saying as long as they have a job, it's okay. And it is true that in many, many underserved communities, the first thing is livelihood. So how do you balance those two? And I ask that to all of you, that there is some tension about the notion of global and the need that is tomorrow, that's today, that's yesterday. Well, I just think you're absolutely right. I mean, I, 
I, I asked the question today when I was down in Seged of, 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 of the team down there. Um, and I said, you know, will we need as many people doing these jobs in 10, 20 years' time? And they said, yeah, we probably will need the same number of people, but they'll be using different parts of, of their brain. So whereas now they might be excellent at data, you know, data management, data entry, probably in 10, 5, 10 years' time, they'll be having to kind of code and write code and program you know, the, the bots, the robots, whatever, the, the digital right. bots, you know, within, within the systems. So it'll be, you know, they'll still need to be there, um, but they'll just be doing something slightly different. Right. So I, I, I mean, I can only completely agree with you. I think we, we just have to encourage, uh, I don't know, I don't want to use jargon, but sort of cognitive flexibility in, right. in, 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 the, right. way, in the way that, you know, people people are educated in, in, in the way that they grow up so that they, because they might, you know, they might have to turn their, their brain to something slightly different, the same way as you might use your arm for, for you know, playing tennis or for, or, you know, for lifting up a weight or, or whatever it is, and you have to well, train it for different things. we know from statistics that 30% jobs that we know today in the world will be gone yeah. in 25 years. Yeah. So if we don't train people to learn so it's really about, and Stanford has just come up with a report that says that young people will at least go through six different careers, yeah. not jobs, careers. And they've got to be excited about that rather, Ex than, I know. rather, rather than fearful. <laughs> exactly. Oh my God, that, you know, exactly. BP's asking me to do something that I don't really, they've got to have the confidence and be excited to say, mm -hmm. yeah, okay, I used to do that, but I'm going to try my hand at that now. And I so the try that competence too. is something yeah. about flexibility. Yes, Clyde. Yeah, and, um, I would like to share an example because uh, most of people, they think uh, global competence is a privilege right. only for those who have resources. Right. But I challenge that. Uh, I uh, mentored over 1,000 students from you know, 10 years ago. Uh, and one of them uh, is from India, uh, from a slum. Um, in his area, um, many students drop out from schools because they just don't know how to study and don't know how to listen <laughs> well. Uh, and eventually he established uh, the first uh, NGO in that slum and he create a new job for himself. He becomes a social entrepreneur, uh, establish an organization called Oscar Foundation using uh, football as a means to encourage students to study well um, and he, he's very successful. And he, because of his work, he's the only one in that slum had left, left um, India. Mm -hmm. And now he travels all over the world uh, developing you know, different kinds of programs. See how global competence can actually empower people. Mm -hmm. And I believe everyone should learn about it and uh, they will create new values of our world. Very nicely put. <laughs> I'm going to open up the floor to all of you. There are microphones on both sides. And if you wouldn't mind just lining up and come up to the, the microphone, identify yourself, and I will limit you to one question per person. And you may direct it to a particular person. And try to be brief, but do get started because we don't have a lot of time. So just let's let's get you on to the microphone. I have plenty of things to talk about, <laughs> but you know, I figured I would open it up for you. No, here we go. Thank you. Yes. Uh, hello. Thank you very much for your uh, very. Uh, oh great opening for the conference. My name is Maya Nenadovic. I'm with the International Association for Intercultural Education. And my question to each member is as follows. How do you disentangle education from ideology? We've heard from the opening speeches about the way that education is nowadays very much a political matter. 
And global competence, as much as we would like to think is apolitical, it's something we believe uh, is deserving for everybody. At the same time, it is very political. So I'm just wondering how do we uh, deal with the concept of polarization, which is at the moment, unfortunately, universal. It's present everywhere. Thank you. It's a terrific question, Clive. I, answer that. Uh, uh, um, I, I would just like to share uh, this year's uh, Yidan Prize laureate, uh, Professor uh, Larry Hutchins from Northwestern University. His work is to use um, statistical methods for meta-analysis uh, to demonstrate the effectiveness of um, um, education methodologies. And it is exactly what he tried to do to uh, use scientific method uh, so that the politicians <laughs> will take seriously uh, what kind of uh, education system works. Uh, he gives new lens in, um, for people to see what's happening in education so that the politicians need to take the responsibility for making better policies uh, despite the beliefs or political bias. So in a way, she's asking about whether you can make, <laughs> remove politics from it. <laughs> and what you're saying is use the Science, data to actually, data. Sub <laughs> ah, if facts matter. Yeah. <laughs> Larissa, any thought on this notion of intersection of politics? And it's very complex. Yeah. Um, uh, and, you know, I mean, personally, I'm super concerned about what's happening around the world. And, right. and I really think that one of the answers is, you know, c getting super educated people from various backgrounds, various walks of life to go through, you know, a fundamentally life-changing experience by serving populations that are potentially different to them in, d in different locations and kind of just creating this new conscious generation of leaders who um, are just kind of getting, you know, populating the education sector with, with solutions that, you know, are not maybe common or are challenging the status quo. Um, I really think that it's just, it's a very complex and it's a very human kind of experience and, and depending on which context you're in, you know. And I think the local context matters. Definitely. So. Again, what is that political context? What is the cultural context? And how do you use it or not? I'd just like to add, I mean, a lot of what we've been talking about so far is global comp competence for the workforce, 21st century skills, what do kids need to learn now to be you know, competitive 10 years down the line because of technology and so on and so forth. We have issues that are happening today. We have genocides that haven't been recognized. You know, the Armenian genocide hasn't been recognized from, you know, 100 years ago. We have the Rohingya crisis today. Like, what are we, how does that all play into, just like world peace, for example? You know, I mean, we're talking about all these things that are gonna happen 10 years down the line, but what does global competence mean just for basic human safety today? Um, I know I'm maybe saying some very challenging well, things I mean, right I now, but I think we need to talk about it. I think the word you're using that I think is worth thinking about is global competence in context. Context matters. That context is local, could be national, could be political, and we think that through because otherwise it will all remain very superficial and abstracted, and that's where you're going with. So I think that's really, really important. Next question. Thank you. Uh, my name is Joe Tort. I work at Purdue University uh, in the US. My, my uh, question is for Peter. Um, I run a global engineering training program uh, for which our students have to accomplish a variety of global tasks, including study abroad and uh, internships with global companies, both domestically and internationally. Um, my question for you, because we are trying to engage with companies to uh, work with our program and engage in the training of students in global competency, how does a university like mine uh, engage with a global company like BP to, uh, to basically uh, partner to uh, train our students in global competency? Well, you probably come and see me after this meeting. <laughs> um, I mean, I, I, I think that, uh, I mean, obviously, we, we do a lot of internships, a lot of training, a, a, lot, of, a lot of opportunities f 
for um, students either to interact with us for a short period during their school days or receive bursaries during their um, university days. We've just launched something called the Skills Refinery. And I would definitely recommend mm -hmm. your students looked at that. It's just launching now, um, and it's for sort of first, second year tertiary students, university, college students, um, <clears throat> and, and it helps them develop sort of via an online platform their own interpersonal skills, cognitive skills, critical, you know, problem solving skills, etc. <clears throat> and then there's a competition at the end of it and that can then lead to, you know, a closer relationship with the company. So I would definitely recommend that. Um, I mean, uh, otherwise I think, um, you know, through, through, the, through the normal uh, mechanisms of, you know, applying for internships and all that, but we can have a we can have a chat about Do it. Do you, um, I know lots of companies now actually, often when they hire employees, they put them through a particular training. Does PP do that? Yeah. To kind of get them to understand both the ethos of the company, but also the notion of the global. Well, we, we, I mean, we buy into the, the notion really of sort of lifelong. Lifelong, yeah. Lifelong, yeah, but when, when you do join, obviously there are, you know, there are, uh, Certain training courses to sort yeah. of bring you in and, and, and partly also to meet your, you know, your, your fellow hires and all the rest of it. But then we have, you know, ways of training people all the way through their careers. Right. And uh, uh, <coughs> personally, I think, you know, um, training is for all of us, whatever right. age we are. So uh, True. if you've got any good training courses, let me know. Next question. And there's nobody coming on this side. I'd love to see some action over there. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, this is I'm Imen Kaya from uh, Tunisia, uh, North Africa. It's an Arab Muslim uh, country, uh, an African country. We are in the, uh, first of all, I'm uh, ATH SDGs ambassador, a uh, twinning ambassador and Microsoft Innovative Educator Fellow. Um, so I'm here to present a session uh, about uh, fostering 21st century skills. Uh, why teaching tolerance and I made, uh, I worked on a project, uh, Let's Be Tolerant, which uh, foster uh, exactly in 21st century skills and focus on tolerance and empathy and critical thinking. And as a computer science teacher, I worked a lot on coding skills. Uh, this being said, uh, code, the coding, uh, it, it was not uh, in the official curriculum in Tunisia, and now we are starting a new uh, curriculum involving coding. And I would love to think that it's, uh, I, I participated in pushing things uh, for this uh, new uh, curriculum. Uh, so the thing I was uh, trying to ask you, how are you going to try to help educators uh, who have, let's say, no voice but uh, social media, like myself? Uh, I have just uh, the power of influencing my fellow educators and push things uh, a little bit, but y you cannot imagine uh, how much effort I made to come here uh, to, to be part of this uh, uh, conference because of financial Tunisia. You can imagine how much we are paid. So uh, to come over here, uh, it was quite a quite challenge for me. But I knew that if I came, I could, I could uh, take something with me back in Tunisia and maybe Tunisia is not going to be among the bottom five uh, list in PISA, uh, <laughs> in the PISA. So how can you, or what are you planning to do to help these educators in the third world countries? Right. Uh, I think that just to say from the perspective of AFS, one of the reasons why we wanted to do this is first of all recognize that not any one of us or one organization can do this alone. So the first is to learn from each other. Then the next thing is to use social media that we can begin to shape it out there because if it is to be a movement, 
The only way it'll work is that each one of us, it's not what are we going to do, it is what are we going to do. And I think that what that means is that there will be opportunities to learn about teachers, to learn about other options, but ultimately the goal is to really make sure that it's widely available, and we're just beginning this. There are lots of people who have done things at different level, and the goal is for us to learn from each other and then share it out. So I would say to you that let's figure out together how we can do that, not just in third world. It is as important in the less privileged communities in the United States or anywhere else. So we need to really think this through, and we won't be able to do it all in two and a half days. But we have to begin somewhere. But uh, I would like to uh, focus on training educators, because uh, I made uh, a, a lot of effort training my fellow uh, right. South uh, Tunisian uh, educators. And, uh, but uh, financial aid, and uh, I don't know how, because pr uh, personally, I had to uh, train uh, these educators on coffee shops. So, right. ye oh. yes, <laughs> and we, right. we were pushed out. So, uh, uh, to, to train educators and to make this a synergy effect and domino effect, right. to uh, sh shift this mindset, to uh, tell them that today, as educators, there is no room to, for, for anybody to work alone and in a closed classrooms and right. walls. And I so think it will take lots of us in different countries. It will take different things. And so we will have to figure out how we move there. But it's clear that teachers are going to be a very important part of this conversation as we go forward. Yes. I would like to add something because, um, uh, as you might know, in absolutely every develop developing country of the world, there is a UN country team that contains the major UN agencies, and UNESCO, I'm sure, is present in Tunisia. UNICEF, I'm sure, is present in Tunisia. So I warmly encourage you to contact them, because this, I'm sure, would be a, a project of interest for the UN country team. Now, I've, you've all been darkened, yeah. <laughs> which means you can't ask questions now. But <laughs> I have one very quick last question, and that is, any one of us can, can you answer it? And that is, what do you see as the greatest threat if we don't embrace the idea of learning to live together as a fundamental need, no matter where you live, work, or study? What do you see as a threat if you don't do it? I think, well, let me, let me kick off and uh, that will give you a little bit more time. Well, I mean, the, the, the greatest threat is that we don't, in my world, is we don't find global solutions. Um, the greatest threat is that, you know, countries, societies operate in, in, in silos and therefore they do what's good for them, but actually in terms of the sort of the bigger kind of planetary right. agenda, um, it kind of, it kind of, Get, get, gets ignored. Um, I mean, that's one other, more, more parochial to my business. It, it would be that we don't access the best talent right. because people don't feel globally competent, they don't feel globally confident, confident yeah. um, and they don't feel sort of enthusiastic about about doing anything outside their immediate environment. Absolutely. And I think, yeah. I think that, you know, for an industry like mine, that would be um, that would be very, very problematic. Um, so those would Absolutely. be my two, a global issue and a local issue. Um, Any other uh, last minute thoughts? I think probably uh, it would be the last thing I want to see. Uh, and probably the world will be some place I, I don't want to live in. Uh, I think people are getting more connected, physically or virtually. But if we don't have uh, global competence, we are so disconnected. Right. Uh, and it seems like we will live in a parallel world, 
but physically in the same, on the same earth. Right. But we are living in our own perspectives. Uh, I'm not sure that uh, we will uh, have a sustainable future if we don't have global governance. Um, I, I completely agree with that. And, and for us in Armenia, you know, increasing global competence both in Armenia and with our, you know, with our neighbors, for example, would mean that we would just be more secure nationally um, and would not live under threat of war all the time. Uh, as an Armenian American, I can say that domestically uh, in the United States, um, you know, there's so much domestic turmoil that's happening right now. There's like such a weird, you know, trend happening right now under this new administration that is polarizing communities. And it's just, as you said, like everyone is connected through Facebook, but are people really connected in, in terms of, you know, their humanity? And, and that's a really big question the to stability me. Stability of the planet and stability of societies is at stake. So I would say yes, exactly. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Well, uh, the United Nations are specialized in uh, uh, overcoming or trying to overcome all the threats and challenges of the world, so I won't mention any now, <laughs> because I want to be positive. Uh, I truly believe that it all depends on absolutely each of us. And I would share, since this is the last word that I have to say in this <laughs> gathering, I would share with you uh, the slogan that my successive teams always had, because I imposed it, I must say, because actually everything about global competence or a lot about global competence uh, is about striving for excellence, right? So I would like to say and to tell the young people here in the room to never stop reaching excellence. Nothing should stop you from reaching excellence, not even success. <laughs> thank you. And on that note, please join me in thanking our great panelists.